So the title was The Story of the Feigenbaum Point. Uh, so I just want to focus today on um, one point of the one remarkable, really remarkable point of the Mandelbrot set. But let me still begin with one of my favorite pictures produced by Dima using Mandel program. <coughs> so it is just a picture of several uh, interesting places of the Mandelbrot set, showing that the Mandelbrot set has some quite remarkable self-similarity features. So, and uh, one of them is, well, most famous is the self-similarity at the Pagenbaum point in this place. So, and you see that that's blow up, and you see that the picture blow up of this part of the picture. You see that it looks exactly like uh, the bigger picture, so self-similarity is absolutely obvious here, that will be the focus of my talk today. It is, uh, the, another picture is, uh, of self-similarity is somewhere here, where you see the little copy of the Mandelbrot set, which just looks almost indistinguishable from the big Mandelbrot set, including this cusp. So, and this cusp is the indication that this copy is so-called primitive copy, that it is not attached to any other component of the Mandelbrot set, but just comes from nowhere. So unlike this satellite copy, which is attached to the main cardioid of the Mandelbrot set. There, are other, there is a other very famous place of self-similarity of the Mandelbrot set of quite different nature. So just at first glance, it is in near the cusp of the Mandelbrot set. And here, if you blow up to the Mandelbrot set near the cusp, you have this obvious, obvious translation invariant. Not scaling invariant, but somehow translation invariant, but still it is in some way a phenomenon of the same nature. And some phenomenon which was paid less attention to, it is self-similarity of the Mandelbrot set at the golden point on the main cardioid. Here, if you start to blow up the Mandelbrot set, you will see very clear, very clear self-similarity observable. Observable, and uh, uh, so it is another remarkable place. And what is uh, great about all that is all these self-similarity features, each of these self-similarity features are related to a certain renormalization theory. All of them kind of so a manifestation of the same kind of phenomenon. And probably I think that maybe that is uh, just four renormalization theories which are required. So on the top of the, well, of the theory of Yakov's puzzle and associated generalized renormalization theory, which is not indicated here, but so this four plus your cause, uh, uh, this, this is all I think which is required to really control very well uh, the Mandelbrot set, to fully geometrically control the Mandelbrot set. As long as we are capable to develop these four renormalization theories to sufficient extent, mm -hmm. then we are in charge. Uh, uh, but it will not be my goal today just to try to so to update you what is going on, we have heard quite a bit about that actually in the previous talks on the normalization, the mini course on the normalization theory. And uh, I, as I mentioned, would like just to focus today on just one particular point, which is this Wiegenbaum point somewhere here. So this Wiegenbaum point, it uh, appears through the cascade of Dublin bifurcations. So, which was discovered actually not by Feigenbaum, but in the 60s by Mirberg, in the 60s. So, he observed that when we cross, so well, I think that it was about real dynamic. So, and we, when we cross this bifurcation point, then the attracting cycle of period one, attracting fixed point, becomes an attracting cycle of period two. 
And I believe he went further, though I did not see particular papers of Mirberg. So, but I believe that, of course, it is natural to go further than and through this cascade, cascade of Dublin bifurcation and all the way to the limiting Feigenbaum point. And what was realized, not at that time, but probably in the 70s, that this point is a, a point which is the boundary point in between regular and chaotic dynamics, at least on the rail line. On the rail line, before this point, the dynamics is quite simple, just almost everything converges to some cycle of period 2 to the n. And after that point, for many parameters, you can observe some chaotic regimes uh, governed by some absolutely continuous invariant measures with positive characteristic exponents. So that was somehow uh, something which already was recognized, I believe, in the 70s, in mid, by mid 70s, uh, that some remarkable, remarkable, interesting feature of this parameter. <clears throat> but then Feigenbaum came and make this wonderful observation just using his uh, calculator, so hand calculator, that there is a self-similarity near this point. So just this bifurcation, po bifurcation points of period doublings through which you go to, to, to the limiting parameters, they scale down in some exponential way to at some, with some rate lambda, which is something like 4.6. So, yeah, well, so it was, it was interesting, it's clear from the picture, of course, from this picture, it's clear that there is this uh, geometric scaling. And then sometime later he observed, so that is a story, so described in his uh, original paper, so he observed that similar scaling rates, so uh, yeah, holds in, so holds in other similar uh, unimodal families of maps, families of unimodal maps. So if you take such a family, like sine family, for instance, instead of quadratic family, and go through cascades of double bifurcation, the rate of convergence will be the same, and it was surprising and required some um, explanations. That was universality feature that, feature that required some explanation. <clears throat> and uh, a kind of, uh, about at the same time, maybe a little later, Couleur and Tresser, so did similar experiments in the dynamical plane and observed some rig universal rigidity features uh, of, the, so of the objects, of the uh, orbits in the dynamical plane for different maps with the same combinatorics. So there was something clearly, something very interesting going on. And being physicists, these people were able to give a very a great explanation, conje great conjectural explanation for this phenomenon, which is called renormalization, uh, universality coming from renormalization. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, we will, I will go to that momentarily. Just let me go to the next slide. It's again reproducing of the same picture, which once again confirms this uh, self-similarity. You see two blows-ups, absolutely impossible to distinguish. Self-similarity is absolutely obvious. But also what is interesting here is so-called hearing phenomenon observed by uh, Jack Milner uh, <clears throat> that somehow if you blow up the whole Mandelbrot set, then there is no self-similarity, but it, it has become more and more dense near this parameter value. That's what he, he called hearing. So you see the Mandelbrot set occupies the dense, bigger and bigger part uh, of the whole plane. Though so in this picture, of course, it's a, uh, some several blow-ups, and we see some fjords still. Of course, there is a complement of the Mandelbrot set. There are these fjords that allow us to penetrate uh, towards the Feigenbaum point, for instance. So it is an interesting phenomenon. Let us keep it in mind. I probably will not go back to this picture later, but I will allude to this Hernes phenomenon and to these fjords a little bit later. Uh, and similar phenomena observed in the dynamical plane. It is the pictures of the Julia set. You start to blow up these pictures, and there is self-similarity. So this, here the self-similarity is obscured by this hereness. There is also dynamical hereness phenomenon. So that the big Julia set, if you blow up, starts to fill in the whole complex plane. So, and on this picture, unfortunately, the little Julia sets are not lightened, so we don't see a precise cell similarity, but you can, you can sort of figure out what would, 
would be little Julia sets which look uh, just undistinguishable one from another. Okay, so let me just, it will be all my pictures, so we can now close, close the screen and I will try to go to the blackboard. It will be interesting experience after a year and a half that I did not, have not touched the blackboard. Let us see how it will work. <clears throat> Okay, so what was, so what was the, mm, this conjectural explanation by physicists of this universality phenomena? Uh, uh, so that was um, done through the renormalization transformation acting in the space of dynamical systems. It's actually something that we heard from Mr. Shishikura the other day, but let me remind you. So if you have, say, a unimodal map, and you have an interval of period two containing the critical point, you go, just you return to this interval and you obtain another unimodal map, unimodal map here. And then you rescale, the, so consider this second iterate of the map, you rescale the original interval to, you rescale this, this interval to the original size, and that is your renormalization. So renormalization, Dublin, Dublin renormalization, that is the only one that I, would like to talk today. So F squared restricted to this central interval. So here is our central interval, rescaled. Rescaled <coughs> appropriately. Just this transformation is very natural to look at, uh, at uh, such, a, uh, such an induced map. Of course, people had been doing um, this, and people in ergodic theory had been doing this for decades before Feigenbaum collateral cell. But I don't think that they looked at this as a transformation acting in the space of dynamical systems. And that is now can be viewed as a transformation acting in the space of unimodal maps. So let's consider a big space of unimodal maps, some infinite dimensional space. And so there is some transformation at least partially defined, partially defined in this space, which is called renormalization. And they conjectured, they conjectured so that this transformation, this transformation. It has a fixed point, so it is highly, it is highly nonlinear transformation. So, and it is not at all obvious that after this taking second iterate and rescaling, you can obtain a map which is exactly the same as you started with. But that was a conjecture which was motivated by physics, by intuition from statistical physics and quantum field theory. So there is this fixed point, and moreover. They conjectured that this fixed point F star is hyperbolic, hyperbolic in the usual dynamical sense. At that time, the theory of hyperbolic dynamical systems was well developed, though it is infinite dimensional situation. Maybe it was less familiar in the infinite dimensional situation. So there is a stable manifold. Stable manifold. And the orbits in the stable manifold converge to this fixed point at exponential rate. So, and there is an unstable manifold, unstable manifold, uh, and the points in the unstable manifold escape at the exponential rate. And also, so the part of the conjecture that this unstable manifold, so the dimension of the unstable manifold will be equal to one. <coughs> so, and appropriately, co dimension of the stable manifold is equal to one. Uh, so, and then, so if you have such picture a little bit refined, maybe, uh, then it gives you explanations of these universalities discovered by Feigenbaum, Collet Reser, namely the, this geometric rate 4.6 that Feigenbaum observed is nothing but the, by the, the eigenvalue in the unstable direction. Uh, so the bifurcation points, will converge bifurcation points in this one parameter family. So this unstable manifold is a one parameter family of maps and bifurcation points in this one parameter family of unimodal maps will converge to this point exactly at this rate because they obtained one from another by inverse iterates of the normalization transformation. And moreover, if you take some other one parameter family, for instance, our, fam our favorite quadratic family of maps, x squared plus c, and you can see the here bifurcation points. So they will be related to these bifurcation points by some holonomy, which happens to be smooth, smooth at this point. And so the rate of convergence will be 
will be the same. At least, so the picture suggested that it is uh, an, an something natural to anticipate. That was this parameter universality originally observed by Feigenbaum. And similarly, so here, so the stable manifold is nothing but the space subspace of maps with the same combinatorics which are infinitely normalizable under this renormalization transformation, under Dublin's renormalization, infinitely normalizable maps, the set of infinitely normalizable maps. And such infinitely normalizable maps, each of them has some counter-attractor, so, uh, so obtained by this dyadic, uh, dyadic uh, so uh, hierarchical construction. So it is one map here, and so you, you can take another map. And so let us take one map, it's just fixed point, F star, and another map will be something else, some other map. F. So then you have these counter attractors on which the dynamics is topologically conjugate, which is fairly simple uh, fact to check. But because under normalization we have here exponential convergence to the fixed point, it means, and normalization is just means looking at the dynamical system at small scale, it means that the small scale structure of this attractor is the same asymptotically as the small scale structure of that attractor. So it is much better, so this conjugacy is not just a topological conjugacy, but something which is much, much better. It is smooth conjugacy, and it's actually it is C1 plus alpha. That is something that was already called several times in the mini course, which is called rigidity phenomenon. Rigidity, so you start with two objects, two dynamical sets, which are a priori just topological equivalent, and you promote this topological topological equivalence by, with some miraculous, for some miraculous reasons, to much better equivalence, and in this situation will be smooth. <coughs> so, <coughs> okay, so that was, that was the conjectural picture by Feigenbaum, Kaletrisser. Mm -mm. And, mm, of course, from the physics point of view, the story was over. The story was over because uh, there is an experiment and there is a theory which fully justifies this experiment. Mathemat mathematically, of course, it was not complete. It was just a conjecture and there was some effort, some big effort in uh, 80s to justify this conjecture. So Mitsu called, so mentioned some names. So it was Landford, Sinai Hanin, Henry Epstein. So, uh, and then, at this, in the 80s, in parallel, there was a development, development very well known in this room, of uh, another field of holomorphic dynamics. It, it looks like a purely real theory, but in parallel, there was a development of holomorphic dynamics, and uh, people started to realize that maybe holomorphic dynamics is the right setting for approaching, for addressing this problem from a mathematical point of view. So I actually believe that Hamel here is responsible for declaring first that quadratic lake maps should be the right frame for this theory. Would you take responsibility? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is... Into the uh -huh. Well, way back when, we're talking about 1982, I was able to make this picture precise on the level of quadratic-like maps, to give specific domains. I was able to prove that the restriction was quasi-conformally equivalent to the original map, that the renormalization was quasi-conformally equivalent. I tried very hard to prove that it was C1, and I was not able to do okay. it. C1, it is this picture. So quasi-conformal, it is a very important geometric lemma which is needed for this picture, which is a very important step for that picture, but certainly it is not yet this universality picture. Anyway, so there was this concept of quadratic like maps. Everybody in this room, I guess, is familiar with this concept. It is nothing but 
complexification of the concept of unimodal map. So, but the right, the trick is, uh, is that the maps, if you want to complexify unimodal maps, which are maps of the interval into itself, so it would not work straightforward, but you need to consider the map from a smaller domain to a bigger domain, which would probably bother Dirk a lot. <laughs> so, so, but that is how it should be defined. So that was the definition of Doherty and Haber. And so Hammer suggested that it would be, should be the right frame. So this space of maps should replace, should be a complex version of the unimodal map. And then it was so articulated in a very brilliant way by Dennis Sullivan in his address. I was not in, in, in Berkeley, I, I read just the proceedings. It is very inspiring paper uh, by Dennis. So when he a sort of laid down a program how one could approach part of this conjecture, part of this conjecture, using this frame of, uh, <coughs> of quadratic like map. So now, instead of unimodal maps, we are drawing totally different picture, picture of quadratic like map. So it is complexification, complexification of, of that picture. And uh, what is uh, quite remarkable here is that well, in a way, it, it, it's already present there, but here it is even more, more remarkable that one can identify the potential stable manifold for, this, for the potential fixed point. So, and this potential stable manifold is what is called a hybrid class. Hybrid class. It is also a notion coming from the Doherty's Harbor, Harbor work. So, two maps are called hybrid equivalent if they are quasi two quasi two. Maps like that are called hybrid equivalent. If they are quasi conformally equivalent, and this equivalence is conformal almost everywhere on the Julia set. And then we can, can consider the hybrid class of maps. And if we are lucky to identify the, an invariant hybrid class, then it would be a potential stable manifold, and we can try to use some ide geometric ideas to capture a fixed point. So, generalization would so. So would, would, would map this complex manifold, so well, potentially complex manifold into itself, and one can try to capture the fixed point using some ideas, so how to, some, some fixed point theorems. <laughs> so, and uh, Dennis's idea was to endow this manifold with a Teich-Muller metric, with a Teich-Muller metric. So, where the distance between two maps, F and F tilde, is two maps are hybrid equivalent, so they are equivalent by some quasi-conformal map H, and you just take log H, log H, as it is, uh, as the Technula theory suggests, and just take the infimum over all possible conjugates. That was the idea, and then, manifestly, renormalization will be weakly contracting in this, in, in this metric, and then one faces problems, which is a sort of similar to what have been discussed, has been discussed here for several days. So that this contraction is weak contraction, one should promote it to strict contraction or uniform and uniform contraction on some places, and then hopefully to capture the fixed point. It took Dennis Sullivan several years to develop the theory, and eventually he, so he was able to justify, justify to carry this part of the program through, namely he sort of indeed justified existence of the fixed point, existence of the fixed point, and uh, convergence or, to this fixed point uh, in the hybrid class. So if you take any other quadratic-like map in the same hybrid class, start to renormalize this quadratic-like map, then it will converge to this fixed point. This part of the picture was justified by Dennis using this idea of Techmura contraction. And with several important geometric ingredients, ingredients which uh, were needed for this justification, and these ingredients were called a priori bounds, which will be a kind of main topic today, a priori, a priori bounds. So that is uh, the bounds of the following type. Uh, uh, so, you, if you consider n fault renormalizations of the map, so we have a map which is infinitely renormalizable, start to renormalize it many times, and so there are these fundamental annuli, 
there is some choice, but if you can make these choices so that the moduli of this fundamental annulus stay away from zero, then this is called, this is referred to a priori bounds. And for real infinitely normalizable maps, and for me, infinitely normalizable today means inf infinitely normalizable in the sense of this Dublin renormalization or in the similar sense for quadratic like map. So which was also defined already in the previous, previous lectures. So if you have an infinitely normalizable map, then under renormalization, this annulate don't degenerate. That is what is called a priori bounds. And let me also immediately mention a notion of a Bo bounds. Bo bounds, it means that this constant epsilon, this bound epsilon, can be made universal, universal, as long as n, so as n, uh, uh, so is sufficiently big depending on the original map f. Of course, we can start with a very bad map, so, but if we renormalize this map sufficiently small, it will become universally good. So, with some quality epsilon naught. Such bounds are called Bo bounds. And <clears throat> so, a priori bounds, so from the point of view of geometric analysis, a priori bounds means, means that the orbits under renormalization are pre compact, and Bo bounds means that there is nucleus for renormalization. There is some space, some set here, compact set compact set in the hybrid class, on, uh, uh, which uh, uh, a sort of absorb, ab absorb all the orbits. You never, no matter how poorly the original map was, then eventually it will be uh, absorbed by, by this compact nucleus. So Dennis did this for real maps, only for real maps. It is also very important to emphasize for today's, for today's talk, for real maps. So the, this was the step this was the step which where real symmetry was really essentially used. Uh, and uh, so other arguments were um, essentially complex arguments. <clears throat> okay, so and <clears throat> that was one important geometric uh, ingredient for Dennis's theory. And another was rigidity. Rigidity. Uh, so, namely, uh, so he showed that if you take a quadratic family that we have seen, so you have this Dublin bifurcation, so we, you have limiting point, which is a Feigenbaum point, but a priori we can Im imagine that there is a whole interval of uh, combinatorial equivalent maps, which are infinitely normalizable in this way, so why not? So uh, there is no reasons to rule out, no soft reasons to rule out this possibility, but using not a, not a priori bounds, but weaker, not this a priori bounds, but re, uh, real version of these bounds, Dennis actually showed that it is not the case, and there is only one, only one Feigenbaum point, Feigenbaum point, in the quadratic family, in the real quadratic family, in the real quadratic family, so C, is real from negative two to one quarter, x is real. So again, let me emphasize, emphasize that it is, uh, uh, so it is both statements, so invoke some reality. <clears throat> okay, that was, that was uh, Dennis's theory. I noticed that it did not produce somehow exponential convergence of renormalizations, but then Kurt McMullen came, uh, uh, and, uh, and he invoked some ideas of hyperbolic geometry, three dimensional hyperbolic geometry, to upgrade this convergence to exponential convergence. Uh, and then uh, I looked at all the whole this story, so and completed it with uh, justifying existence of the unstable manifold. So these results were. Uh, solely about what happens in this hybrid class, which is a stable manifold for the fixed point, but then one should construct the unstable manifold, and they justified, then there is this one-dimensional unstable manifold through this fixed point. Also, I, I kind of I uh, suggested the placement of Macmillan's geometric idea with some 
just uh, simple, more simply minded Schwarz lemma in the Banach spaces. One can use just the classical Schwarz lemma in Banach spaces, which sounds, it sounds exactly like the classical Schwarz lemma from 19th century to justify exponential convergence here. Uh -uh. So it was somehow, it was some ideas of geometric analysis so which helped me to justify this, uh, this unstable manifold. One can say nonlinear non -linear dynamics in infinite dimensional spaces, na namely some small orbits theorem in the spirit of Peretz marker in the infinite dimensional, in the infinite dimensional. So that was somehow the story, the story. And also let me mention that uh, it was Arthur Avila who actually looked at this uh, uh, afterwards, and he managed to replace this initial story with story of geometric analysis. Somehow one of his insights was that he somehow replaced the technical metric with the Karasadori metric. Karasadori metric. Uh, Dori metric in the, in the hybrid class. It is some also some kind of hyperbolic metric, hyperbolic metric in the complex space, and it can be can be uh, done also in infinite dimensional situation. It turns out that this metric is very amenable, so it is very easy to work with it, and somehow easier to develop the theory with character Dori metric rather than the original technical metric. <clears throat> so it is kind of the same idea. There should be some hyperbolicity of this hybrid class, which allows to apply some kind of Schwarz lab. Uh, um, OK, so that is, that is the story of the universality from the point of view of holomorphic, holomorphic dynamics. And it all happens in 90s or uh, early 2000s. Artur's, um, Artur came, came in early 2000s. It, it was our joint paper. This part of Avila. So, <clears throat> uh, okay. So, but now all of us know the uh, MLC conjecture, the D and Hubbard's MLC conjecture that the Mandelbrot set is locally connected. And uh, the question is with all this tremendous information about this parameter value. Can we actually this, the justify that MLC happens in this particular parameter value? So just take this unique Feigenbaum point on the real line and try to prove that the MLC conjecture uh, so, uh, is valid in this parameter value. And I thought actually, I first thought that it is obvious consequence of this story. Let me explain why. Let me explain why. One can be tricked in such a belief. Uh -uh. So very simple because so what is MLC conjecture? What if, so MLC conjecture is a Feigenbaum point. So we have at the Feigenbaum point, but around Feigenbaum point we have all these all the satellite copies of the Mandelbrot set, first satellite copies and second satellite copies, etc. So M1 contains M2, contains M3, etc. And so they all contain our real Feigenbaum point, a unique real Feigenbaum point. <clears throat> so what do we need to justify that Mandelbrot set is locally connected? It was known from classical times of Doe and Hubbard that all what is needed is that the intersection of these copies is actually a single point. This rigidity statement. It is a combinatorial class of infinite normalizable maps with Dublin combinatorics. And all we need to know is that there is only one point so in this combinatorial class. And we do know this for the real parameter. But we need to know this for the complex parameter, of course. This intersection, so it can touch, touch the real line in some point C node, but then it, it could be some complex decorations here. So in, in principle. But it looks, it appears that. Because we have this cell similarity picture, we have this unstable manifold where the Monday broad sets in the, on the, so if you, if you think of the unstable manifold, so it is just complex one parameter family. So let me now draw it as a complex family. 
And so there is a point C naught here, and there are these Mandelbrot sets, Mandelbrot sets around this point, which has just scaled down under with this rate 4.6, with the Feigenbaum rate 4.6. So this one should be 4.6 smaller than this one, this one 4.6 smaller times than the previous one, etc. So obviously diameter is much shrink to zero, and we are done. We are done in the unstable manifold, and then we can transfer this information by holonomy to the quadratic family. So it's obvious, obvious that, obviously that and this, uh, this picture, this you know, universal you know, normalization picture implies MLC. However, not so fast. The problem is that not all parameters are a priori visible in the unstable manifold. We have some unstable manifold, which is given, was given from some, uh, so some theory, some geometric analysis theory. So, the, and it is kind of semi-local. It is, you start locally, and then you can try to extend it further, you obtain some semi-local object. And it is not obvious at all that the Mandelbrot set is compactly embedded into this unstable manifold. That is the question. Is, so we have a Mandelbrot set in the unstable manifold. Is, this com is it compactly embedded in the unstable manifold? Is it compactly embedded in the unstable manifold? Maybe unstable manifold goes to infinity somehow in the space of quadratic like maps, and some points, some points escape. And then we have unbounded object and it has infinite diameter here in the unstable manifold, and the fact that this object is four times six smaller does not give us much information. So it was, the MLC did not follow from this. MLC Misha, yes. when you say MLC, you mean MLC at the Feigenbaum point? I'm talking only about Feigenbaum point. MLC at the Feigenbaum point. Today, it is the only parameter value. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, MLC did not fall. So uh, there was some follow-up of these attempts. One of the follow-ups was to justify, at least at this particular point, to justify it numerically. So, uh, so somehow one should prove that certain, uh, certain parameter object is compact, and one could try to, to do this in principle. If you think a little bit, you see that in principle there is a chance to do it, and Scott Sutherland had a student graduate student who made an effort to do that, but calculations still turned out to be too heavy, so it did not lead to success. Another uh, effort would be somehow to try to understand better this unstable manifold, to really try to understand the parameter picture in this unstable manifold. And that is what we looked at with Dima Dutko just a couple of years ago, quite carefully in this kind of problems. And it is a problem from transcendental dynamics. <coughs> transcendental dynamics. <coughs> so, which is close to hearts of many people here. So, <coughs> and one of the bridges between the normalization theory and transcendental dynamics is right here. And now you, let me uh, recall you that we saw this picture of blow-ups of the Mandelbrot sets, and the picture of blow-ups of the Mandelbrot set is nothing but the picture of the is nothing as the picture of the Mandelbrot set on the unstable manifold. If you start to blow up quadratic Mandelbrot set, you will see this picture, and so in this picture you see these fjords, and these fjords in the limit becomes analogs of the unstable or analogs of the rays, external rays for the transcendental dynamics, transcendental dynamics which actually is induced on the unstable manifolds. On the unstable manifold dynamics becomes, there is some natural transcendental dynamics and there is actually natural defined external rays which are limits of these fjords that we see on our initial, initial picture. And also the problem is very simple. So just if there is some structure, one can see some combinatorial structure of, of this race, one can describe conjecturally this combinatorial structure. And if really one is able to justify this structure with some clever ideas of Picard type or Thurston type, then it will be done. So the, the consequence, the MLC, the MLC would fall as well. So it is a challenge for people like Costa like Bogdanov, so because it's exactly the theorem of realization of external rays for some transcendental maps. But it is more complicated transcendental maps than entire functions that Kostya handled so far. <laughs> so, 
So we, didn't, we were not successful in justifying, in getting the result on this. Uh, on <coughs> okay, so, so, but then there is another path, there is another path, and this path through this rigidity, rigidity statement, so as, a, as we see, so MLC uh, amounts to the um, rigidity statement that the combinatorial class is reduced to one point, and I had, in my early work, I had some conditional statement, what is needed to do it. So let us see, let me try this one. Let me try this one. Okay, here we have a priori bounds, it is very good. So, and, uh, so if we just, so where is the eraser? Uh -uh. Ah, here it is, the table. Mm -mm. So rigid, such a rigidity, rigidity statement I had long ago, let us call it a theorem. So if a priori bounds, a priori bounds hold, hold over the combinatorial class, over the combinatorial class, then MLC as a corresponding parameter, MLC at C naught follows. So all we need, all we need is to prove a priori bounds over the whole class. And as I told you, Dennis Sullivan proved them for real parameter and concluded from there that there is a unique, a unique point. But if we're just successful in doing this for complex parameters, then, mm -mm, then we would uh, prove the analogous complex statement and it is MLC at this point. Mm -mm. Okay, and now, so let, uh, so, so let me switch to completely, we can forget about anything else and we can now fully focus on the problem of a priori bound. So that is one problem that remained, remained open after that story. So just to complete the picture, complete the picture at the Feigenbaum point, all we needed is to have a priori bounds for over the whole combinatorial class, which means for all infinitely normalizable quadratic maps in the sense of Dublin normalization. So, but not only real, but complex. Okay, and here Jeremy Kahn comes. So in the uh, late 90s, he comes with new ideas that Dima alluded to yesterday. Uh, so and this idea is also inspired very much by Thurston theory, which is, which is one of the main topics of, of this workshop. So just to try to prove uh, a priori bounds, and a priori bounds is pre-compactness of the orbits, as we know from another point of view, by contradiction from, by contradiction, so assume that the orbit escapes, it means that the corresponding Riemann surfaces degenerate. So we know how, how Riemann surfaces can degenerate. So, and this produce some families of curves or arcs, satisfying certain invariant conditions, and you can play with that and try to get something out of it. <clears throat> that was Jeremy's idea, that one should just invoke a similar, similar set of ideas as in the source transfer. And Dima sort of gave some, uh, well, some insight yesterday into this set of ideas. And let me see, so Dirk, so how much time do I have? 15, okay, I have a have meaningful amount of time. Okay, so, uh, well, we need to understand how Riemann surfaces degenerate, and in the classical Thurston theory, so it is Riemann surfaces of finite type, so they degenerate along long tubes. Everybody here knows that, but here we are dealing with renormalization pictures, and the renormalization picture is like that. So you have you have some disk, and you have on certain level of renormalization level. You have several 
little Julia sets, little Julia sets. And let me just blow up this little Julia sets for this discussion. I can just blow up them to disks. And so we have such a Riemann surface. So what does it mean for this Riemann surface to degenerate? Of course, it can degenerate along certain annuli, which can be, uh, so it is also possible, but somehow it is not very interesting for our discussion. That is simple generalization from the point of view of this discussion. More interesting discussion is that such Riemann surfaces can degenerate along white rectangles. So, so degeneration happens along white rectangles. Rectangles. And this means that the picture looks not like I have drawn here, but something like that. So, so we have say, this, this domain, which is conformally very close to the boundary, can be very close to the boundary. So here you have a rectangle, topological rectangle, which is certainly conformally equivalent to a true rectangle. So, and we have this path family, and you calculate the width of this path family, which is inverse of the length. So width of this path family, it is inverse of the extremal length, and on this picture, if it is H, it is L, then this width is just L over H. L over H in this uniformization. So, <clears throat> So there is this small distance, small conformal distance, extremal distance between this island and outer boundary. And of course, there could be small conformal distances between islands themselves. So you can have a white rectangles, white rectangles in between islands. So, uh, and that is the way how Riemann surfaces with boundary, this kind of Riemann surfaces like disk with several disks removed. That is Riemann surfaces which are of interest for us. So uh, how they degenerate? It is interesting degeneration from our point of view. It happens not along the closed curves, but it happens along rectangles. Or one can say that it happens along arcs. One can just encode homotopy class of this arc, so it could be much more interesting, could be much more interesting than this one. Uh, uh, so, but it is difficult in the degenerate picture, near degenerate picture, it is difficult to draw interesting homotopy classes. So uh, let me draw a Riemann surface. Now it's regular, so it is, we imagine that it is near degenerate. And there are some arcs, some arcs along which this Riemann surface degenerates. So, I don't know, there are these arcs, and you see that obviously it, is, it would be difficult to draw a white rectangle corresponding to, white rectangle corresponding to this arc. It's, it's all, it is what Dima called uh, Photoshop. So this picture is a Photoshop for this kind of picture. So Riemann surface, Riemann such Riemann surface with boundary, it degenerates along some family of arcs. And then there is this principle that Jeremy put forward. Mm -mm. Yes. So I'm, now I'm telling the story that was developed by Jeremy Kahn. It was the story by Jeremy Kahn in mm -mm, 2000s, mm -mm, so early 2000s. So, he, so he, this ox, this ox could be. Yeah. So there is this principle that he puts forward. So which. He formulated like, if the life is bad today, then if it was even worse yesterday, or it was even worse 10 days ago. So, and, uh, so from our point of view, it means the following. If we have some degeneration, some, degener some degeneration, so the width of this normalization, so the width of this normalization is very big on some level, and then, it was even bigger, even bigger, a few levels up, a few levels up. Uh -uh. So it was twice bigger, say, twice bigger. And then it was the generation in the, so if we go from here, if we go two N levels up, then it will get even bigger degeneration, and then we will get even bigger degeneration. It's contradiction because we can, start with a non-degenerate map. We can start with a quadratic polynomial. So, and it will tell us that quadratic polynomial will not be able to generate to this threshold. 
So that is a sort of general, general strategy, very general strategy. That's one how to play with this generation, but how to justify this kind of things, how to justify this kind of state. And now let me give you a rough idea. So, uh, so among these arcs, you see horizontal arcs, which connect two little Julia sets, horizontal arc, and you see vertical arcs, vertical arcs which connect Julia sets to outer boundary, to outer boundary. And so, and then the, so let it be, say, level n minus n, and this would be level n. This would be level little n. So, say, central, central Julia set on level n. <clears throat> but I, my picture is too complicated, so again, it is difficult. difficult. Let me draw a simply minded picture. So, just there are some vertical arcs, there are some horizontal arcs, and that is it. So, let me not try to, to draw realistic pictures. So of course, much of the difficulties of this theory is topological, topological difficulties playing with complicated curves. Uh -uh. So, and who is responsible for the weight, for the weight uh, of the, on this level, n minus n? It is, you see, only vertical are responsible for the weight on this level. So this level, this level is total vertical weight. It is total vertical. And what is responsible for the weight on this level? On this level, we have just local weight around Rickles Julia said, and it is like one, one over P. Let the period here for little Julia said, in general, we have P, little Julia said, which we should select, which is sufficiently big if n is big. So P is two to the n. Uh, uh, so here you see uh, all these local horizontal and vertical arcs around this little Julia set. And it is like one over P of total weight, total degeneration weight. So here, here we see one, oh, of course it is all up to some constants, one over P, Total, total weight, mm -mm. total weight. Uh -uh. So you see P, we can select sufficiently big. We can go to sufficiently deep normalization level, P is big. And uh, so we want one over P of total to be much smaller than total vertical. And this would be successful if we know that total vertical is a definite part of the total weight. So all we need is to prove that the total vertical, that the total vertical, and here is big, quote, big question mark, total vertical is comparable with total. <clears throat> if total vertical is comparable with total, then this principle, this Jeremy's principle, can be realized because the uh, weight on this level will be like one over P of the of the width of this annulus. Width of this annulus will be like one over P of width of this annulus. And that's exactly what we want. Okay, so, and I, I want to give you uh, just very fast idea, very quick idea, so how it can be accomplished. Uh, and uh, uh, why it was not the end of the story. Misha, you're talking about a definite part of something. Of what? So we have definite part of total weight. Sorry. And uh, what is total? What is weight? Total weight. Yeah, weight is uh, total weight. So we have these rectangles. So these arcs, they symbolize rectangles. These arcs that I cannot bring back. I want to bring them back. No, no, no. Oh, is, yes. is this something like uh, the conformal modulus so, of so these here, families of curves or something like that? Yes, here we think of rectangles. This arc represents rectangles. Okay. Each of these rectangles has width, which I also called weight. Sorry, I should have said that. And then we can just calculate total weights of these arcs, okay. total weights. And on the other hand, we can calculate total weights of the vertical arc. And all we, we need to know is that vertical weight is a definite part of the total weight. It's not too small compared with the total. And then we can realize this strategy. Then we can realize this strategy. And uh, so, and the general outline, the general outline 
uh, uh, goes like that. Uh, <laughs> so here is our picture. Here is our picture, and we have this. Mm, I, I should I should put here these guys, little Julia sets, and we want to create. So there, there are these vertical vertical weights and horizontal vertical arcs, vertical arcs and horizontal arcs, and we want to create a lot of a lot of vertical arcs. So we start to restrict restrict the domain of our quadratic like map. We start to restrict the domain of a quadratic like map. And then you see that under restriction, some of the horizontal become vertical. And the claim is that we can restrict approximately p times, where p is a period, so that definite part of the horizontal will become vertical after restriction. And this claim depends on the assumption that the combinatorics of our renormalization is not Dublin, but for instance, Triplin, <laughs> and, not, and not Rabbit, that the combinatorics is primitive. So there is this claim that if the combinatorics is primitive, then after restrictions, after restrictions, so good part of horizontal, horizontal will become vertical. So, and it has to do with the entropy on the Hubbard tree. Entropy, and for primitive guys, entropy on the Hubbard tree positive. And it makes all the vertical arcs on the pullbacks to pull off. There is a lemma in Pilgrim's thesis, very good lemma of Pilgrim's thesis, which says that if you take a vertical horizontal arc and start to pull it back, then it will pull off in the primitive case. In the satellite case, also many of them will pull off, but not all. And so that is the moment when primitive demoralization was used in Jeremy's, in Jeremy's argument. So his theorem, his theorem covered so all primitive bounded types. So theorem of Khan, of Khan, so MLC through a priori bounds, MLC through a priori bounds at primitively renormalizable guys. Primitively renormalizable guys. Renormalizable. Oh. Bounded, bounded, bounded. So for instance, airplane. Airplane is the subject of Kahn's theorem. Feigenbaum is not a subject of Kahn's theorem because entropy for the satellite case on the, on the Hubbard tree is zero. And this step of the argument does not work. We want after restrictions, so we want to, uh, to, to, to create a lot of vertical, it does not. But then there is a second step, which works perfectly well. We, we restrict it, but then we created a lot of vertical, but then we want to push it forward, uh, so to the original domain, because it would not be good to restrict the domain. It, is, it would be a dirty trick, so we don't want that. So, and then one can use the last step, which is push forward of the vertical, push forward, of the vertical weight, of the vertical weight, and it is done by means of the covering lemma. Covering lemma that some people know here, which was worked out by Jeremy, Jeremy and myself. <coughs> so it allows to, to push forward the, the sort of the, it is not trivial step because it requires push forward under the map of huge degree, two to the n, the degree is huge. But the gray on the little Julia sets is small. And in the near degenerate situation, it turns out that it is enough to have this degree on the local degree on little Julia sets small in order to be able to push forward without much, much loss. So that is rough outline of Jeremy's argument. It covered not only real, but all complex primitive combinatorics of bounded type, but remarkably, it did not cover the classical figure bound point. So, and that is the last thing that I would like to announce today is that now with Dima.coin, so uh -uh, we have recently been able to prove to complete, complete the story for the Feigenbaum situation. <clears throat> for the Feigenbaum point, so it is a theorem. So by 
zero, and myself, that MLC does hold, holds at the Figenbaum parameter. So let me call it C Figenbaum. <coughs> and for that matter, at any satellite infinitely normalizable in the satellite way of bounded type. So, but today I'm talking about, about Feigenbaum parameter. And somehow <coughs> we just looked carefully so where the Jeremy strategy stops. Uh, so it stops with certain arcs. So there is a very well specified arcs which, uh, arc, arcs which uh, don't pull off. It is easy to recognize these arcs. And then one can try to uh, analyze so how these arcs affect the situation. And it turns out that one can adjust this Jeremy strategy a little bit. So in the following way, so one can um, prove such a statement. So if the generation is big on some level, then either it is much bigger it is much bigger on a previous level. It is like Jeremy's part, or else, or else it is much, much bigger on the next level. R n plus one, the weight on the n plus one's level would be like, so L times C, the L can be selected arbitrarily big as, so, so L is a huge number. So, so somehow, so if the Jeremy strategy fails, then one can put much bigger, not twice bigger, but much bigger degeneration just on the next level. And there is a very simple statement actually uh, coming from the Techmuller contraction, Techmuller contraction in the hybrid classes. So very simple statement that degeneration cannot happen with a super exponential rate. So because of the Techmuller contraction, logarithm of Kn, so you imagine that you have some hybrid class and you have some orbit which escapes to infinity. And because there is a contraction, then this distance is smaller than the next is smaller than that. So the distance from here to here, which is logarithm of Kn, it is ob oblique of n. It is, so the Techmuller distance <clears throat> distance uh, can grow only linearly, it means that the generation Kn can grow only exponential. So super exponential rate of degeneration is not allowed by the Teichmuller contraction, which somehow resonates with the original Sullivan's idea. So, and that is a contradiction. And I think that at this stage already, indeed, we can somehow claim that we have full understanding of the Feigenbaum, Feigenbaum parameter. Though there are still interesting questions about the geometry of the Feigenbaum Julia set. For instance, a challenging question for analysts, whether the Julia set of the Feigenbaum map is removable. So some people love removability, and uh, we know so much about the geometry, the self-similar geometry of the Julia sets of the Feigenbaum map. It is still open question, seems to be tremendously, very, very uh, difficult analytical, geometric analytical question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Misha, for this wonderful talk. We have the first questions already. Is there any relation with Artyom Dudko result that Hausdorff dimension is less than two? Um, so Intuitively, yeah, it might it be related things. I think that um, certainly tools that Artyom and Scott Sutherland develop in order to prove uh, with computer assistance that the um, Hausdorff dimension of this Feigenbaum Julia set is strictly less than two, and in particular, measure is zero, the back measure is zero. They developed nice geometric tools, which uh, could be very useful. But it is, it is certainly, it is certainly the next question. But seems to be much more difficult question somehow. Uh, I don't think that there is a strategy really to approach this removability, removability uh, for for this map. Mm -mm. 
I, we discussed this with our colleague, new colleague, Dimitrios Talam Pekos, so a student, former student of Mario Bonk, who is an expert of on removability, and it, we discussed it for some time, and it seems to be tremendous, quite difficult problem. So. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Any more questions or comments? I, I have a question. Okay, let's so, go um, can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. So, so, so Misha, um, you had this beautiful picture of the uh, transcendental dynamics uh, for the Feigenbaum point um, and the transcendental map um, and this picture of the parameter space, which would have allowed us to uh, conclude um, yes. MLC at the Feigenbaum point. You know, now it seems that uh, um, you, you showed that actually we don't need that for, in order to get MLC at the Feigenbaum point. Is there anything um, about the Feigenbaum point that we'd like to know that we could still get from understanding this picture of the, of the um, unstable manifold um, and its structure better? Well, I think that uh, this kind of uh, deeper geometric questions about um, the geometry of Julia set and Mandelbrot set would uh, we may need some ideas of transcendental dynamics. So again, I'm, I'm discussing various geometric problems about these sets with my students and colleagues, and it seems that it is a very useful set of ideas So in these deeper questions. MLC can be bypassed, so for MLC, this kind of questions can be bypassed, as we see, but uh, there are other questions which, well, like removability, that is, that is certainly uh, ideas of transcendental dynamics could be useful. Uh, one can ask similar. Thank you. Uh, maybe if I ask, may I ask one more quick question? Can we have you said there's only one point. We have a local candidate here, and then you can go back. All right, sorry, fine. <laughs> okay, no, I mean, your turn, as I just see. Lasse. Okay, okay, so um, uh, just very quickly, because you said there's only one point, namely the Feigenbaum point, but in your argument, um, how important is it that this is the Feigenbaum point, or, uh, or uh, what else might it apply to? Uh, no, no, it seems that the argument should work for, more or less in straightforward ways, the same argument applies to any infinitely normalizable uh, maps of bounded satellite type. Bounded satellite type is covered by this argument. We believe Fantastic, we, thank, it is, thank you. Yeah, and it is just uh, slightly combinatorially more involved, but not much. Uh -um. More questions here from the audience or online in the big world? Comments, improvements, <laughs> counterexamples, anything? I, I sort of have a No counter example. Counter example, yes. <laughs> so I suppose that your proofs prove that the also that the set of these infinitely renormalizable uh, parts of the Mandelbrot set actually have measure zero, these bounded renormalizations. Yeah, absolutely. With the theory which was developed before, it would require this renormalization theory for maps of bounded type, so it is a counter set which, which is produced by renormalization and it would follow. Okay, I have sort of doubtful quality numerical evidence that the boundary of the Mandelbrot set actually has positive area. I I'm not at all convinced that my evidence is good, but then again, I'm not convinced that it's bad either. Okay. And I wonder, I mean, I gather what you are proving is that if it actually does have positive area, this positive area is entirely carried by the renormalizable re uh, uh, polynomials of infinite renormalizable type. So, uh, well, it is certainly one of the possible conclusions from this contradiction. Another conclusion is that numerical evidence is not conclusive. So, and I have, I have a theoretic, I have a kind of a very simple argument to prove that the measure zero, let me show it to you. So I think that all of us actually believe 
that not only MLC holes, but all these little copies of the Mandelbrot set have uniformly bounded shape. Nobody saw, have you ever seen on the pictures, really distorted little copy of the Mandelbrot set? Probably not. Nobody has seen apparently really distorted copy of the Mandelbrot set. And what it means, that if you take a parameter value, any, some infinitely normalizable parameter value, and you take a little copy of the Mandelbrot set around this parameter value, which is not distorted, which is uniformly quasi-conformally equivalent to the original Mandelbrot set, then in this copy there is a definite gap. It is just the interior of the main cardioid. It is just the main hyperbolic component. Is the gap in all scales, in, not in all scales, but in arbitrary small scales, near any infinitely normalizable parameter. So if you are able to show me numerically a really distorted copy of the little Mandelbrot set, I would, I would accept possibility of your conjecture. But otherwise, otherwise, I believe that all of them have uniformly bounded shape, and it trivially implies that the measure of the set of infinitely normalizable parameters is zero by the back density point theorem. I must say, I have looked at a lot of pictures of the Mandelbrot set. And I have never seen a seriously distorted I, one. I think that it is serious numerical evidence that the measure is zero of the boundary of the Monday bird. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there are good reasons to question such numerics. We looked at them. Um, I, I think that the, the, these supposedly positive measure evidence. I was more excited about earlier on, but this is another thing we can discuss. So, meanwhile, more questions from anyone? Uh, can I have a brief question? <coughs> okay, Davud. So this is uh, the a prior bound result. Does it allow you to eventually say that uh, a small enough copy is contained in the unstable manifold? And apply the other theory and say that say the the little copies scale according to this constant at the the real constant. Yes, yes. So it would be enough. So with this uh, with this attempt to use unstable manifold to prove MLC, it would certainly be enough to know that one little copy is in compactly fully contained, fully contained in the unstable manifold, and then all. Further copies will be scaled with the ratio 4.6, and MLC would follow immediately. So, uh, but uh, it did not happen that way. But now, when MLC, uh, uh, as long as MLC is established at this point, then we do know that these copies uh, become small, so they must be eventually trapped in the unstable manifold, and so they must scale as the whole copy, as they must scale with the uh, right fading bomb rate. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Davut. OK, last call. Lasse, is that you again? Uh, have you still raised your hand, or is it a new question? No, it's OK. Greetings from Lasse. Greetings back to you. OK, then it's my great pleasure to introduce, as a reward for all of you here, the, the Buya base in a half hour. And until that time, well, let us thank Misha one more time for his great talk. Thank you.